Hey guys, it's Laurel Ann. Can you believe that it's already summer, basically? Uh, because I can. I love summer. I truly feel like I'm most myself in the summer. Although I, I do have to say, I'm not that excited to be on the East Coast for summer because it is way hotter and more humid than in the climates that I've been living in for the last four years. I also don't like air conditioning. Is summer my favorite season? Anyway, that whole tangent aside, as you know, I kind of like to round out every season with a little favorites video where I kind of summarize some of the things that I've been consuming and enjoying over the last three months. So that's what this is, my spring favorites. What have I loved this spring? Stay tuned to find out. Hi guys! I filmed this video a few weeks ago and I really just didn't feel comfortable posting it without acknowledging the ongoing human rights crisis. So before I take you to my favorites, I just wanted to offer three resources on race and civic action that you can read right now for free. This of course is by no means an exhaustive list and I don't want to present myself as some kind of authority. It's just three really accessible writings that I think could serve as a really good starting point if you're looking to educate yourself and they're all things that I have found immensely helpful over the years. These will all be linked below and I will also link to a page that has three I think publishers that have titles on policing in America that are available for free download right now um, as well. I've not read those which is why I'm not talking about them today but I do plan to read at least one of them so I just thought I would uh, stick that down there because it's again another really good free resources that's really relevant right now. First we have Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. He wrote this in 1963 in response to clergymen who were publicly criticizing his actions and questioning his methods. Um, this is a super foundational text and I, when I first read it in college I found it very helpful and it was very formative sort of at the beginning of my progressive journey. This letter will help you see a different side to Dr. King and it's also really interesting to see how many of the concerns that he's addressing are the exact same arguments that we're seeing today from conservatives and moderates. I think this can be really helpful in informing your rhetoric when responding to people who are dubious about this current wave of activism and you may also find that he confronts some of your own conceptions. If you haven't read this before it really really is a must. It's very short and very informative, very important. And even if you have read it before, I really urge you to read it again if you have not already. Next, I want to recommend Loving Blackness as Political Resistance by Bell Hooks. This is the first essay in her book, Black Looks, Race and Representation which you can also read in its entirety at the link I've provided, but I've chosen this essay in particular because I think it really concisely describes the lived experience of internalized racism and um, really gracefully exposes the way in which white people and even white liberals actively reinforce it. Uh, sorry if you can hear the neighbor's lawn mower. Um, I can't close the window because there's a cat in it. The idea of anti-racism has really shot into the mainstream lately and I think that's really great, but I don't think you can really manifest anti-racism unless you yourself are aware of the ways in which you perpetuate these ideas. So I think this is a really good place to help you kind of confront these things in yourself and it also is very short and it has a lot of really juicy quotes in it that again might be helpful in your sort of um, social media fights that you may or may not be having. And finally I have Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. This is a really interesting one because its core argument is one that I think is a little bit more radical than what a lot of liberals might be used to engaging with. Even if you don't come away agreeing completely with prison abolition, you can learn a lot from this book. She really concisely summarizes other 19th and 20th century abolition movements and she also really deftly explains how slavery was allowed to continue in the South long after the Civil War through tools like the Black Codes and the convict lease system and she kind of exposes how the current trend or the trend from the 80s and 90s of prison privatization is really just an extension or reincarnation of those earlier 
tools. This is also a really good example of true intersectionality because it allows you to really see how white supremacy and capitalism really work together to oppress people of color. This obviously is a little bit longer because it's a whole book, but it's really not particularly time consuming. I reread it just this morning to make sure that I did want to recommend it in this video. Um, and I'm really glad I did because it definitely hit differently today than it did when I was an undergrad. I think that even if you feel like you're really engaged in this moment, you can still learn a lot from Angela Davis. So um, I really highly recommend this one as well. Obviously, this whole point is that I'm recommending these resources. So that's all. I really, really hope you guys check this out. And now on to the rest of the video. TV has definitely been a little bit hit and miss for me over the last few months. Is it just me or is the golden age of television over? I think it might be over. A lot of television seems to be bad now. But a show that has been a great surprise to me is Lovesick, formerly known as Scrotal Recall, which I think is a Channel 4 show in the UK, but um, Netflix has the global distribution rights, so they get to claim that it's a Netflix original even though it's not, which I think is a little bit shady, but whatever, I don't know anything about the politics of the television industry. What am I doing with my hands? This is a sitcom about three 20-something best friends led by Dylan who finds out in the pilot that he has chlamydia. So he has to systematically contact all the women who he's had sex with over the last couple of years. And so each episode, for the first couple seasons at least, is a different woman. And so you get to see a vignette of their relationship and you also slowly learn more about his history with his friends and also kind of how the relationships with his friends have progressed over the years because you kind of jump back to the present. It's quite funny and it's surprisingly sweet as well. It's also filmed and set in Glasgow, Scotland and I think it does a really good job of making Glasgow look like a really beautiful city and I think that's a really nice thing because that's a city that is kind of undervalued in the UK. The only thing that bugs me about it is that even though they're in Glasgow, pretty much every character is English. They've had like three named Scottish characters in the whole show that I've seen. And it just, it just bugs me that the UK is so against having non-southern English accents on television other than like reality TV. Like let's get some real northerners and let's get some real Scottish people, please. My sister was here for her spring break during the first week in March and as a little surprise I took her up to New York. She told me while we were there that she had not been there since high school so I really enjoyed getting to show her around and showing her some of my favorite spots in the city. I'm by no means a New York expert, I just uh, like to visit it sometimes. And I also took her to see Six the Musical. It was my second time seeing it in three months. A girl she went to high school with is playing Katherine Parr. Uh, so it was just like really cool to see her like I saw her in in her shows in high school and now she's on Broadway and then a week after that was when the world shut down and Broadway got canceled forever so I'm just really really grateful that I got to have that little experience um, before b before before quarantine oh and we also went to MoMA which is one of my favorite ways to spend a day in the entire world. And as a bonus, neither of us got coronavirus. One thing that I am certainly grateful for all the time, but especially right now, is podcasts. I've just been super enjoying them lately. So I have a couple to recommend to you today. One is called Wind of Change. This is just an eight episode series. I binged this over the course of like two or three days. It's hosted by New Yorker writer Patrick Radden Keefe, who years ago heard a rumor through a friend that the song Wind of Change was written by the CIA. And um, Wind of Change is this kind of corny pop rock ballad from the 80s that you might not know if you're American, but it's very, very popular in Europe. I know I heard it all the time when I lived in the Czech Republic, but I didn't know what it was. So, you know, it was kind of kind of fun to put a name to the face, so to speak. And this is a song that inspired a lot of people pretty much right at the end of the Cold War and the time that the Berlin Wall fell and everything. Sorry, I saw something 
flying around in the corner and it startled me. So Patrick goes on this journey to Germany and Ukraine and he talks to all these CIA people to try and discover whether or not this rumor is true, whether or not the CIA wrote this song. And the answer to that question actually ends up being kind of secondary um, and it really becomes more about the nature of propaganda and the history of the CIA and the US State Department sort of intervening in pop culture. It was a very fun and entertaining ride but I also felt like I learned a lot about it. And it also was not too like it didn't glorify the CIA too much, in my opinion. Um, I think that's kind of a tricky tightrope to walk, you know? Like, you want to tell these cool stories about things that they've done, but you also don't want to overlook the fact that they've staged a lot of uh, coups in other countries, which is not that cool. If you're into, like, any kind of conspiracy theories or just, like, weird stories, I think you would probably definitely like this. And it's also just really well produced and well reported. And then on kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, I have been loving the Scaredy Cats Horror Show, which is hosted by PJ Vogt and Alex Goldman, who are also the hosts of Reply All, which is one of my favorite podcasts of all time. The story behind this podcast is that Alex loves horror movies, which I also do, and PJ is absolutely terrified of them and can't watch anything remotely scary without having nightmares. So every two weeks Alex assigns PJ a horror movie to watch and ostensibly they're moving from kind of unscary to more scary. Don't know how successful that's been given that the first one was The Exorcist, which a lot of people find very scary, but anyway. Every week, at least so far, they've had a different guest on. Um, the first week was Jason Mantzoukas, who I love. I've also been watching along with the movies, which has been a lot of fun. I actually just watched Nightmare on Elm, Elm Street for the first time because of the podcast. My favorite film is also the last film I saw in cinemas possibly ever, and that is the new adaptation of Emma. It is cast with some truly impeccable actors. It fantastically and fabulously captures the humor of Jane Austen's Emma, and is also just so stylish and sumptuous to look at. The costumes are like, are to die for, quite frankly. I think Lena Norms said in a video that she made on her channel that this is the Emma adaptation that Jane Austen would have made, and I feel like that is extremely accurate. Like, I, I, I really think that it perfectly captures Jane Austen's sense of humor and sense of satire. I just ordered it on DVD, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited to watch it again. It's also available on demand from Amazon and those other folks as well. So if you haven't seen it yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And I say that as somebody who loves Emma the book, so yeah, I think it's a perfect adaptation and I could not say more about it. I've read a lot of really good books this spring, but I think my favorite would have to be How to Be Both by Ali Smith. This has kind of been the year of Ali Smith for me, and I do think that this is probably my favorite that I've read so far. I love the seasonal books as well, but this one I think just like spoke to me on a more personal level, and yeah, I loved it. I'm not gonna go too much into it here because I haven't wrapped it up yet, so I'm just gonna wait to talk about it then. But Ali Smith is my new girlfriend. I am just kind of obsessed with this video essay that Jack Saint made on his channel about Cars, the Pixar movie, and eugenics. I think it's called Oops Disney's Cars Did Eugenics or something. Um, he also has another earlier video about how Sky High is actually eugenics propaganda. I think he does a really good job in his sort of um, children's media video essays of mixing really profound and well thought out analysis with a humor that sort of exposes the absurdity of the positions that he's taking. I will link the video below. I think you should all watch it for a laugh and also maybe to get your mind, your mind wheels turn in a little. I have been baking homemade bagels 
And this is something that I never really even considered attempting uh, because I don't know why. I've been making bread for about a year now, but homemade bagels just seemed like a step too far. But I finally tried them because what else have we got to do? And they're so good. They're just as good as the ones from the bagel shops in New Jersey and New York that I usually only have once or twice a year. So I'm just really happy that I can have them in my home. But I'm sad that I did not discover that this was a skill I had when I lived in the UK where bagels are disgusting. I'll leave the recipe that I've been using in the below box description. And if you are interested in making bagels, I recommend trying it. It's really not as hard as it sounds. So a few weeks ago, my mom and I kind of finally, it finally sunk in that this summer we were probably gonna be stuck in this house. So we decided we want to make our outdoor deck just like the cozy oasis that it was born to be. So we splurged on this amazing outdoor sectional and I just love spending time out there in the morning and in the evening and I'm really, really happy that we did that and it makes me feel very fancy. All right, so those are just some of the things I've been liking. I would love your recommendations for stuff. You guys, I think, know my taste. So if you know of anything that you think I would like, uh, please tell me because I'm consuming loads of media loads and loads. Okay, bye. Alex loves podcasts and PJ podcasts. They both love podcasts. They're podcast hosts. No, no, no. Bye. Oh my god. I feel like I was so annoying in that video.